Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Heute Abend gibt es ja noch die Premiere. Und wir haben ja nicht nur den Mann, der sich das alles ausgedacht hat und gedreht hat, heute hier zu Gast, sondern ich glaube ein paar äh, Schauspieler, auf die wir uns alle gemeinsam sehr freuen, vor allen Dingen, dass sie gemeinsam vor der Kamera gestanden haben. In diesem Fall nochmal ganz herzlich willkommen, offiziell im Namen von Sony Pictures Germany. Please welcome Shannon McIntosh. Wir machen weiter mit einem Mann, der Berlin liebt und ein absoluter Superstar ist. Please welcome Brad Pitt. Wir machen weiter mit einem weiteren Superstar. Please welcome Leonardo DiCaprio. The one and only Quentin Tarantino. The wonderful Margot Robbie. Last but not least, producer David Heyman. Welcome. I've done a little bit of research on the Manson family, but just before I was getting ready to do a, a deep dive and really, really start doing the, the research and really learning the whys and wherefores and learning more about them than I, I knew a lot, but I was going to now learn a whole lot more. But even the idea, I mean, the movie, you don't hear Charlie talk, but I wrote some scenes where you actually see Charlie. We shot him. We just didn't make the movie. But even to try to get to know Charles Manson enough that I could write his vocal rhythms so I could write his speech patterns and write the way he talks. I was like, do I want to do that? <laughs> Do I want to let these guys into my head like that? Do I want to know Charles Manson so well that I can write his speech patterns? And I, uh, you know, four or five years ago, I was like, uh, I don't think so. <laughs> and so I, I, I put it away and, and, and did something else. But then the material that I wrote, I liked so much that it just kind of, after that project was, was over, it gravitated me back to it. And then in between projects, I just kind of pushed the rock up the hill a little bit further. Well, it's a lot about his growing up and uh, his memories of being a child in Hollywood and driving around uh, Los Angeles. And you, when you see the marquees and the theaters, I mean, those are things that were actually there. And as a kid, those were there. And we, the radio, which is a backdrop, KHJ, are also part of his memories of driving around Hollywood and listening to the sounds of KHJ. Well, I think nobody else could make this film but Quentin. You know, it's got his singular voice. Um, it is, as Shannon said, and as you indicated, an incredibly personal film. It has, it's just so full of life and originality and, fr and, and uh, freshness, and really it is a film that could be made by no other. Uh, you feel that in every frame. You know, Quentin brings such enthusiasm to making films, and um, one of the pleasure, it's a great pleasure to work on his films because of that. And you can see that enthusiasm in every frame of this film. I knew I always wanted to reach out to my idols, Quentin being at the top of the list, um, at one point in my life and let them know how much their movies meant to me and affected well, my career choice and my taste in movies. And I uh, wrote Quentin a letter, but I held off for a couple of years. I didn't feel like I was really at the stage of my career where I felt like I um, was ready to reach out. I didn't think I was a good enough actor yet. Um, and then I watched the first cut of I, Tonya, and I thought, okay, I feel like I've uh, hit the point where I'm happy with my acting now. Now I'm going to reach out to my idol. So <laughs> I wrote him a letter, and fortuitously it was great timing. It timed out nicely, and um, we met up. We spoke about Sharon. We spoke about the film. I got to read the script when it was done, and um, here we are. I just love the way he constructed the story of two sort of voyeurs, two guys that are on the outskirts of Hollywood, and giving us this incredible backstory of who these men were beforehand. We all, the second Brad and I stepped on set, we had this incredible history together that we implicitly and I think instinctually knew. So we're able to infuse all that in sort of two or three days of their life where you don't tell a full story, but we, we had this sort of, sort of silent understanding of our past. And that was, that's what's so amazing about a journey like this is trying to tell a story and a condensed time period like that, but all of us having that understanding of, of our own history. Quentin chose to tell the story of, of I guess, um, filmmaking process, television process through a, a, a stuntman, an actor at that time, which was much closer. But we all here, sitting here, rely on our, our friends uh, specifically for, to to survive this thing, to enjoy this thing, to to negotiate our way through it. Um, there's a lot of lot of lot of downtime, more downtime than actually than actual action time, 
And so it was, uh, I mean, we had, it was pretty automatic <coughs> for Leo and I because we, um, we could just step right into that. And, and like Leo says, the backstory, I mean, there, there's a whole, there's probably two movies of prequels and backstory <laughs> yeah. that, that Quentin laid out for us. So it was, um, it was good fun. Right now it's a really interesting time because you see the cinema experience shrinking, you see streaming exploding. The positive of that is you see this wealth of talent that's been on the sidelines all this time, this wealth of talent, directors and writers and actors, and, it's, and really gutsy storytelling is being, um, is being embraced. So that is really, really fun to watch. Um, what happens to the communal experience? Uh, we'll see. I don't think it'll go away, but um, it's certainly certainly in a shift right now. But I, we go with the times. We go with the changes, and 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 it's all it's all right with me. <laughs> I don't think it can ever go away. Um, people will always, I believe, want to go out to movie theaters and have that experience. It is the greatest art form in the world. I'm honored to be a part of it. And as Brad mentioned, you know, we're entering an era where we're inundated with not only content and information, but new, amazing, you know, stories are being told. The, the format of which remains to be seen, whether the two hour, three hour format will stay intact or whether things are going to be seven part <coughs> series because, you know, there's so much content, but I don't think we're ever going to lose that communal experience of being able to go out to a theater together and feel the energy of a movie we're excited about. And that's why this movie was so incredible and awesome and I'm honored to be a part of because it's a, it's a, a big budget, fantastic art film. And that we may see a lot less of, but that's why you guys got to keep going to theaters and supporting films like this. In the case of, uh Inglorious Bastards. I mean, basically, I just wrote myself into a corner, and then I had to figure out how to get out. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, they're supposed to kill Hitler, and then they're, I'm, I'm writing it, and actually, everything's going pretty good. <laughs> I'm like, Jesus, th this could actually work, all right? Uh, I thought they'd get caught before now. And, uh, and so I didn't know what to do, and it was like 4 o'clock in the morning or something like that. And then I just thought, what if I just fucking kill him? <laughs> you know, I, I I didn't want it to be like you know, oh, it's a they killed him, but it's a double because I've seen that before, and the eagle has landed, or they didn't want to have to slip him out the back door. I, so I just said, no, I'll just fucking kill him. And then uh, I took a piece of paper. It was like four in the morning. I took a piece of paper and I just wrote on the piece of paper, just fucking kill him. And I laid it on the bedside table and I went to bed. And I thought when I get up the next day, I'd see that piece of paper and either think it was an idiotic idea or it was a good idea. And uh, after a night's sleep, and I looked at it and I go, no, that's a great idea. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> now, Brad wasn't down with it at first, all right? Uh, we, we, I go to talk to him about it. And uh, uh, we're having a nice conversation. And he goes, OK, I'm not so sure about this killing Hitler thing. I'm going to do it. Okay, that's not the question. I'm going to do it. I'm just not so sure about it, all right? But then at some point, I think about like three weeks into the movie or something, he showed up on set and he goes, I've got religion. I think it's a great idea. <laughs> now, I remember reading the script and going, can you do that? Can you, can you kill Hitler? Why not? I actually heard a cool thing. Somebody was saying that... Um, they were 12 years old and they were seeing Pulp Fiction with their dad and like the, the credits are playing and then like you hear a, a miserloo and then all of a sudden the radio changes and it goes to Jungle Boogie. So like we change the opening credit song in the middle of it. And then the 12 year old kid turns to his father and goes, can they do that? And the father goes, now they can. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, one of the things I like about <laughs> driving with music, I'm, sure everybody in the room has this feeling of like you kind of feel like you're in the opening credit sequence of your own movie <laughs> you know when you get the, like the, when you can actually go kind of fast and like not stop and start and you pick like the right song you just yeah it feels like like it's the quentin movie and this is the opening credits and the, 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 uh, what's going to happen next is going to be a big adventure <laughs> and so i wouldn't say that this is like my favorite song for that but a, a song that works really well because they use it that way in, in the movie was blondie's call me the way they use it, uh, Richard Gere, you know, driving through mm. Beverly Hills to call me. He was like, that was a great opening credit sequence. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have a playlist that's 
mo- like songs that have been in Tarantino films. <laughs> I listen to that a lot. <laughs> you pick a good song. You pick a great song. I'm tuned to one channel, and that's 40s Junction, 40s music. <laughs> Really boring. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I got a fr- oh, friend who. You can try to swing, swing, swing. <laughs> yeah. Right. I know of someone who listens only to classical and then watches everyone on the street and it's like comedy for him. When, <laughs> I'm, so like when I'm in traffic, I listen to classical. Yeah. Like calm for the calm, for the yeah. LA traffic. Yeah. I, li- I listen to stand up comedy. Hmm. That's my gig. <laughs> That's his thing. I mean, we were <laughs> blessed that we were able to shoot it in Hollywood and all around Los Angeles area and that we got the incentive and that people were really on board. It's a very location-based movie. So we moved around a lot. Very rarely were we in any place. We started off for two weeks in one place and then we were on the move the whole time. But we had a wonderful team who got it set up, our location, production designer, and everyone was really very fluid about getting it done and worked their butts off. We wouldn't be able to do what we did like next year. (laughs) It's gonna, it'll be, a little too much changed. We wouldn't be able to do it exactly as we did, like even next year. Even as it was, things were changing during the shoot. So it was like we were on a bridge that was on fire, burning behind us, and we were just trying to get our stuff, and then and then, then the bridge would go away. And like it was kind of that way through the whole hundred days of shooting. Mm-hmm. You got to understand, Quentin is a purist, so that means no CG. Everything we're going to get everything in camera. So to see Hollywood Boulevard, even the stretch we did. What did we shoot? Four blocks? blocks. They dressed. And then we came back a month or so later to do a few more blocks to piece that whole thing together so we could get the street. But what what was stunning to see was the depth of detail (laughs) that only comes from Tarantino. And that is like not just the bus stop benches where ads from that time, but then even in the store windows, things that you'll never see, the pamphlets of of some radio show of that time or books of that time. It, it was that deep in detail and we just go whizzing by, but it was it was really pretty special to uh, see Hollywood Boulevard transform that way. I mean, it's funny because uh, you do a Western, you're, you're, you're making a period film, but for some reason, I mean, I know it's a period film compared to if I was making a movie that takes place today, but you know, you go to a Western town. I just, it just doesn't seem, it, it didn't seem as much of a, I, it just seems controlled in a strange way where um, this is close enough to our time, but it's also incredibly different. And so it creates a different kind of uh, um, uh, detail. Um, I got to say one of the things after doing uh, a 40s World War II movie and two Westerns back to back, the fact that I could just have a character turn on the radio and just enjoy a song for 10 minutes was just, it was almost orgasmic for me. I couldn't, it was just so much fun. Oh my God, I can turn the radio on again. They can listen to records again. I can have rock and roll in my movies again. It's been a decade since I've had rock and roll in my movies. Oh, unless I did it anachronistically, which I did. All right, you know, so uh, the fact that characters could just like Godardian groove to records was uh, fantastic. <laughs> I just kind of uh, uh, so in bet- so I kind of worked on the film in between projects, and just I just kind of thought that was just kind of the way it was going to be, and then uh, in, after and I thought maybe this might be my last movie, but then I started writing at this time, and then like oh hey the the horses just ran away all right so I was uh, oh I guess I'm going to finish it. Sergio Leone is kind of the the father of of what I guess what I would call modern movies. Um, both his use of uh, the way he used music, but even more importantly, um, the way he put it together and then cut to music. That was not really done before. Uh, people would do uh, soundtracks, and even when they put like you know uh, Rock Around the Clock or something uh, in a movie, they wouldn't cut it to the movies. I mean, every once in a while it would sync up in a neat way, but it's not cut to it in this way, uh, partly because uh, they didn't know what the music was going to be until after the film was over. Well, Leone had Morricone write the music before the movie. But also, the other thing about Leone is I like the idea that, uh, you know, him and a lot of the Spaghetti Western guys, they started out as film critics, very similar to the way that uh, the French New Wave did. And no one really loved movies more than those guys. And they loved Westerns. And I love the idea that uh, they loved Westerns, but they knew they were making Western movies, so they wanted to do it their way, and I love that. And I also love the idea of thinking in, uh, cinematically, thinking in terms of set pieces, 
the way Leone did, where it's like a, an eight minute cinematic set piece that's just completely onto its own, or a 15 minute or a 12 minute. I mean, if you look at Once Upon a Time in the West, I mean, that is just a collection of set pieces just connected to each other. Well, I love that. I love set pieces. I love, to me, that's like, you know, that's when you know that you're sitting in a movie theater, you know, and then the film is just taking you over. And then you know, like the, uh, 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 you're thinking uh, Wolf of Wall Street, the, uh, uh, the Quaalude. Right. Sequence is fucking amazing, all right? And it's like 15 minutes, right at the end of a 30, a three hour movie. And it's, I never want it to end. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. We love your movies and we love you guys being here in Berlin. Thank you so much, Thank David, you. Margot, Quentin, Thank Leonardo. You. Thank you, Megan, for feeling so Thanks. welcome. Thank you. 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 Have a wonderful premiere tonight. I Thank you, guys. Thank you. 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 Thank